In 2019, Todd Phillips decided to give modern Hollywood the finger because woke culture hates comedy and anything that disagrees with that worldview. The result was Joker, an astonishingly good and grounded movie shedding light on the indifference of society, the hardships of the downtrodden, as well as the potential dangers should things get out of hand with mostly peaceful protests. At the center was Arthur Fleck, a man who tried to put joy into the world only to be crushed so much that he devolved from a well-meaning troubled man into a murderous monster. Joker broke a billion dollars at the box office on a 50 million production budget, and despite corporate media's every attempt to will a mass shooting into existence, nothing happened, because fans of the movie understand it's just a movie. It was contained and complete. So obviously DC and Warner Bros. said fuck that and greenlit a sequel with four times the budget to get Todd Phillips to capture lightning in a bottle a second time. And collectively, just about everyone in the world uttered the 25th letter of the English alphabet with more question marks and exclamation points than a PC can physically compute. Then it was revealed the movie would also be a musical, and even the most red-kneed Broadway star threw themselves back into the closet to avoid the backlash this film was about to receive. To say this movie is divisive is putting it mildly, and what has been most intriguing is the discussion around it. Specifically, the question of whether or not Folly Ado is a middle finger to the fans or not. So in the interest of giving my thoughts, I'll break down the whole story so that we're all on the same page, and then I'll discuss the details. All right? Joker, Folly Ado, begins with a Looney Tunes-inspired cartoon recapping the conclusion of the first Joker. Arthur's shadow takes control, committing the acts leading to his arrest. In the present, two years after the events of Joker, Arthur is in Arkham, awaiting trial for the murders he committed. Arthur is mocked and belittled by the guards, led by Jackie Sullivan, while his lawyer, Marianne, works with Arthur to convince the general public Joker is a split personality. On his way to a psych evaluation, he crosses paths with Harley, who is also in Arkham, and she knows about him and even mimics Murray's gunshot. The evaluation doesn't go well, since the only thing he really remembers is the music. Later, for some reason, Sullivan decides to be nice and bring Arthur back to the music hall where they join the class for the day. Believe me, this is the first of many unanswered questions. While the rest of the class sings, both Arthur and Harley step outside and get to know each other. Harley says she was abused by her dad, burnt down her parents' apartment building, and was instituted for it. Harley then adds that she loves the Joker movie. Fourth wall much. She's a big fan, like so many others, and on his way back to his cell, Arthur pats Sullivan on the back, thanking him for the opportunity, and then he gets smacked upside the head so hard it revived a few of my own gray memories. The next day in the recess hall, Arthur learns that the prosecutor, Harvey Dent, is seeking the death penalty, and Arthur starts singing about how he can't give up because now he has someone, that being Harley. The next day, Arthur is brought into the music hall again, where they watch a movie, and Harley asks Arthur if he wants to sneak off somewhere, but he refuses because he's enthralled by the movie. Harley ain't happy with this, then sneaks away, sets the piano on fire, and in the chaos, runs out the front door with Arthur in tow. The attempted escape is foiled, and Arthur is thrown in solitary confinement, where later that night, Harley is allowed into the room. What the hell? And get this, she tells Arthur she's being released from the asylum to prevent influencing him. Why? She almost burnt down the building. How is she not in solitary confinement? And how did she get in here? Well, she bribe the guards, of course. With what? Besides giving the guards her cuckoo kachu, I can't imagine the guards would break protocol like this. Whatever, she and Arthur bang, and the next day, Arthur gives an interview, and when pressed about the Joker persona, he breaks into song. But this time, it isn't in his head, like the rest of them. The next day, court begins. There is a massive crowd, and another musical starts. And then the super serious judge says that he will not allow his court to become a circus. It does. And basically promising to be the most serious character in the movie. He isn't. This is proven when Arthur throws up Richard Nixon peace signs and super fans in costume are allowed into the courtroom. Okay. The first day of court establishes the main arguments. The prosecutor believes Arthur is faking the Joker persona, while Arthur's defense disagrees. The next few court days basically repeat the same arguments, with Harley receiving better seating each time. And when she's had enough of Marianne's coddling of Arthur, she makes a scene about how popular Joker is, selling tons of merchandise, and storms out the court. Later, Marianne tells Arthur Harley lied about everything, that she's really a psychiatric student, comes from a good family, and 
didn't burn down their apartment. Arthur isn't sure about this, and another musical about his doubts of Harley begins shortly before she visits Arthur. He confronts Harley about her lies, and she admits to it all, but downplays specific elements. When she realizes Arthur won't relent, she drops the bombshell that she's pregnant. It hasn't even been a week! I know it's possible, but given the context, I don't believe her. The comment completely changes Arthur's manner, straightening him out. The next day at court, Sophie is the witness, saying Arthur never harmed her or her daughter, but states the movie about Joker was terrible. Noticing a pattern? She adds Arthur's mother made up the lie about his uncontrollable laugh to shut him up. Arthur spirals at this point with another internal musical, then spontaneously fires Marianne, chooses to represent himself, and kisses her on the lips. Hey Judge, you gonna do anything about the circus your court just became? No? Figured. Back at Arkham, the inmates start singing and supporting Arthur, and they all get beaten by the guards. The next day, in court, Arthur arrives in full Joker costume and makeup, because of course he does, and the midget Arthur spared, Gary, takes the stand and gives an emotional testimony about how he can't go to work or do anything else because he's still haunted by what Arthur did. And after a defensively suicidal questioning, the prosecution rests their case, since Arthur did their job for them, and in a bold strategy, Arthur rests his defense as well. Let's see how it works out for him. In his defense, he also mocked the prison guards in Arkham, and breaks into another internal song about him and Harley later on. And then that night, Sullivan and the guards drag Arthur to the furthest reaches of the showers, beat the crap out of him, and then off-screen, take turns raping him. Afterwards, he's thrown half-nude into his room, waking his inmate friend, who starts singing. Still in the throes of rage, Sullivan rips this dude right out of his room and murders him. And then the next day, Harley sings about Arthur being wrapped around her finger as she dresses herself up and heads to the courtroom. There, Arthur lays it all out, that the Joker persona was made up, that he's aware of what he did, and confesses to the additional murder of his mother. Harley, distraught, leaves the court, and Later, Arthur calls her and sings, hoping she'll answer. The next day, when the court is being read, the side of the courtroom fucking explodes. Apparently, someone managed to drive a car bomb next to the courthouse. Many of those in the room are injured or killed, Harvey Dent is done extra quispy, and Arthur stumbles outside, where he's abducted by a pair of superfans and driven off into the city. Where was security? Why was someone allowed to drive a vehicle into the alley next to the courthouse? And most importantly, why was the neighboring building hardly scratched? Again, no answers. Anyway, composing himself, Arthur gets out of the car and runs away with the superfans giving chase. Until they don't. That evening, after wandering New York City this whole time and not being spotted, nor having the cops called on him, he finds Harley standing at the top of the stairs from the first movie. How did you know he would be there? Why were you waiting there? Answers, what do those taste like? So, Arthur tries to convince her they can run away together and start over. Then Harley stops him, and in as direct a manner as possible, to paraphrase, the only thing we had was the fantasy. There is no Joker. Goodbye, Arthur. Talk about some heavy foreshadowing. Then she sings to him about how the show is over, and walks away just as the cops happen to arrive. The next day in Arkham, the guards say Arthur's got a visitor, and in the hallway, the guard walked ahead, and one of the nutty inmates stops Arthur, asking him if he wants to hear a joke. The joke is basically a play on what Arthur said at the end of the first movie, telling him about how disappointed he is, and even ending with the quote, you get what you fucking deserve, before stabbing Arthur to death. As Arthur lay dying in his own pool of blood, the inmate carves up his own face into a smile, and the movie ends. All right, there is a lot to get through, so let's start with the least I have to talk about, that being the positives. First off, the acting is pretty damn good. I would not be surprised to hear Phoenix or Gaga receive nominations for their performances. Everyone here does a good job, as most of the superficial details are well executed on a technical level. This cannot be argued, especially in the musical performances. Everyone looks like they're immersed in their performances as though they are the level of musician they imagine themselves to be barring Gaga, of course. I don't really have an issue with the music either. I'm not a big fan of the 70s and 80s musical styles, with exceptions like Steely Dan and Manowar, so the music doesn't resonate with me, though it gets the emotional point across in the moment. It all tries to serve a purpose, but it's undercut by the writing. This is where the real problems lie. I've used the analogy before that movies are like rope. The more and better entwined the threads, the stronger the rope. If threads are weak, then it compromises the integrity of the rope. 
Most movies, especially nowadays, are cheap, weak, and fray at numerous points, making them only worthy of the trash bin. The aforementioned acting, performances, music, and whatnot are some of the strong threads I mentioned, but as I recapped, I'm sure you noticed I began asking more questions mid-summary. That's because there are many more issues fundamental to the creation of this rope that fray worse and worse towards the end until it's virtually unusable. And the core bundle of string here is the characters, so let's tackle Arthur first. To begin, and this is more an issue of the authorial intent than anything else, which I will cover last, it's that Arthur is treated as terribly as he was. Joker is a great movie, and you root for Arthur despite knowing he will eventually fail. He was beaten, abused, manipulated, and tormented. It's when he switches gears and starts killing people out of anger and lashing out at others is when that sympathy turns to disdain, regardless of their deserved ridicule or punishment. The issue with Joker, a mighty poo, is that the movie resents the man as the monster from start to finish. Most of these changes are because this isn't even the same Arthur. The movie doesn't start with Joker in control and works to redeem Arthur by separating the man from the monster, nor does it carry on with Joker in control from beginning to end. It starts with Arthur bearing the consequences for Joker's actions, which makes sense, but actively tries to destroy him from then on. This is beyond losing a save file, this is straight up New Game Plus. To the degree, defining character traits are completely different as well. This brings me to the inclusion of the music. Again, most of it's fine, it's that the music is now integral to Arthur's character. In Joker, Arthur listened to music like any other person, but never when he withdrew into himself like he does here. For example, after he acquired the revolver, he puts on some music and starts playing pretend in his apartment like he's some badass until the gun goes off and it shatters the fantasy. Besides this and a couple other examples, Arthur never withdrew to the point Point of full-on musical until Joker for seduce. When he did withdraw, it was a violent fantasy, like stomping the dude in the back alley. And stupidly, these are some of the only times Arthur really gets to do something without being dragged around by others. His lawyer, Marianne, directs him around to interviews and keeps him on point. Harley manipulates Arthur from the moment they first meet with constant lies and literally dragging him outside. The guards turn Arthur into the butt of every joke, and then turn his butt into a joke. Even the super fan at the end of the movie carry him off when he's delirious until he realizes where he is and takes off. Arthur has as little agency as a plot standard MacGuffin. Even his dancing is altered. In Joker, when Arthur danced, you could interpret it as perhaps the most genuine expression of himself. When it was for others, like the children, it was to entertain. When he played pretend by himself, it boosted his ego. As his psyche broke down, it became more erratic, more jagged. Now he's clammed up and hardly does anything unless he's in his own head head. Gone is the expression and acceptance of what he became. This is not the Arthur Fleck, nor the Joker of the previous movie, and any relation is in name only. Now, with Discount Arthur out of the way, let's plunge into Harley. Her defining trait is convenience. She pops up like a rash at the most inopportune moments for what Phillips had in mind, but without believable reason. She checked herself into Arkham, hoping to meet Arthur. Okay, no problem. But then she nearly burns the entire building down and tried to escape with Arthur, and her pun punishment is to be released without consequence? Are you kidding? Why isn't she being transferred to another prison or thrown in solitary confinement? Arthur's tossed in solitary and five minutes later she joins and they bang. And her excuse? Well, of course she bribed the guards. With what? Her body? Unimportant. What matters is that she's here, so stop thinking about the how and stick to the now. It's frustrating because this repeatedly happens. She wants to see Arthur after every court session, even though she's a horrible influence. No one stops her. She, like Arthur, is allowed to dress up, turning the courtroom into a circus and not kicked out. She smashes a window and steals a small TV in front of a group of people and no one tries to stop her. Now, this isn't to say that all things are bad. The most interesting aspect of her character is the role reversal as she preys upon Arthur in this film and not the other way around as Joker always has. She's manipulating Arthur into being the Joker because she loves the fantasy and wants the public attention for herself. It works until the issues I've mentioned rear their ugly heads. Her actions and intentions also have the 
the extra added layer of mean-spiritedness with multiple statements spoken directly to both Arthur and the audience. As I mentioned, she exaggerates the quality of the Joker movie, and then claims that she's pregnant when she visits him in Arkham. She makes the claim as a way to shift the focus of the conversation, which again was Arthur calling her out for lying. It's all in service of her metaphorically gutting him and twisting the knife when she indirectly admits everything was a lie by singing to him at the end. Now, there isn't much to say about the side characters, as they aren't involved enough to really warrant much discussion. Harvey is the prosecutor and nothing more. Gary has that big testimony of his that cuts deep into Arthur, but then he leaves the movie. The judge is just stupid. He allows things to get out of hand despite saying otherwise. And then Sophie is an interesting inclusion because she's primarily there to solidify the negative intent of the film. Her statement, as I said, is about harming Arthur and breaking down one of the few things he held onto about his mother. Besides that, she serves little purpose. And then there's Sullivan. I would never have concluded that he was a gay murderer, or the other guards for that matter. My reading of making Arthur kiss another inmate was just degradation, as they obviously have been for a while. So when they take Arthur in the back and skip the drop the soap phase, I was flabbergasted because there's no other setup. Again, this is a consistent element with characters doing things for the sake of scenes that Phillips has in his mind with little in the way of build-up or reason. And because of the direct nature of these choices, you're left with more confusion than intrigue, the latter of which is almost completely destroyed for both movies by this one. How about Harley's pregnancy? She bribed the guards to join Arthur in solitary, then a few days later claims she's pregnant. The question of what did Harley bribe the guards with could be inferred to have been herself, and thus, the kid wasn't Arthur's. That could have led to even greater heartbreak. Instead, when Arthur asks her about his potential kid, Harley sings to him, that's showbiz. Again, any questions you have by that point of the film are thrown out the window as the fog of illusion around both movies is blown away. Take, for example, the delusions he had about Sophie in the first Joker when they express agreement in the elevator or she supports him in the comedy club. These moments blurred the line of reality, so you weren't really sure what was real and what wasn't until more truths were revealed and we pieced together what's happening parallel to his world and psyche shattering. Now, everything is lazily distinct. Big, elaborate musical numbers are definitively in his head or dreams because there's no effort to obviously skate reality. It's all just layer after layer bolstering the resentful intent of the movie. Which now brings me to the main point. So let's discuss the last thing, and that being the controversy of whether or not Joker Filet Mignon was a middle finger to the fans. Kind of. This required a bit of research, and since I don't like to hear what others have to say until after I've made my own conclusion, I had to fire up my other brain cell. So good job me. Here's what I found. After Joker's success, Todd Phillips proposed DC Black, but without the .com at the end. An article by ComicBookMovie.com has some details at the bottom, where I found the quotes bringing up DC Black, in which Phillips would create isolated character studies parallel, but not tied to, the DCEU. This was not to be, as the quote here shows Warner Bros. was not keen on the idea. I don't know why the mileage in Batman's library of villains alone could potentially be a multi-billion dollar franchise that draws even non-superhero fans into the fold, but I forget. Studios nowadays are allergic to money. Anyway, an article by Variety from August details that shortly after Joker's release, Joaquin Phoenix had a dream about exploring Arthur's continued struggles as a Broadway musical. This is where the musical idea came from, but it didn't take off because of the pandemic. Fast forward to June 2022, and the DCEU is basically operating in the black. Birds of Prey, Wonder Woman 1984, and Zack Snyder's Justice League all failed spectacularly. So the potential for another billion dollar hit to make a recovery on the losses with Joker, a creamy wet poo, was greenlit. Later in October of that year, the Suicide Squad and Black Adam also failed. And then, James Gunn was announced as the lead for the DCEU reboot. Now from then to the beginning of filming, I believe Phillips became disillusioned and sabotaged Joker Nutty Duo. Now, I don't think anybody can confirm this 100%. I don't think anyone but Todd Phillips could. But articles have popped up in an attempt to explain the fallout like this one from Variety. This article details Todd Phillips had complete control of the movie, he refused notes by James Gunn, and most petty of all, there was no DC logo, which I can confirm. I believe Todd Phillips became 
became disheartened after DC initially brushed him off and gave the reins of their new direction to James Gunn. So Phillips made Joker sing along to purposely fail and in doing so, demanded a lot of money, which he got paid, stuck to the goofy decisions like the musical direction, knowing the studio wouldn't question anything, and sabotaged the integrity and legacy of the first film to drive fans away, ultimately ensuring DC would lose the most amount of money. Again, I could be wrong, and Joker, Monkey Abu, was a genuine attempt by Phillips to prove his DC Black proposal, but he ultimately blew it. And if this is true, then it would further diminish Joker's legacy as nothing more than a fluke of a lucky director, and DC was correct to deny Phillips the reins of a new series of projects. All in all, regardless of intent, Joker, Scrappy Adu, is a legacy destroyer in the same vein as The Last Jedi, in that it fundamentally ruins any mystery, character development, and more, just as The Last Jedi torched established lore and characters of Star Wars. Don't waste your time with it, and like Superman, create some mental blocks to prevent yourself from ever hearing about this train wreck again, and in order to also preserve Joker in your mind. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.